five seconds. So I will restart now. Dear friends, thank you for joining us on day two of Creative Armenia Week, our signature summit on the state of art, which is bringing together cultural icons and powerful new voices in a slate of discussions all throughout this coming week. My name is Gadin Hovanissian. I'm the founder of Creative Armenia, an arts foundation for the Armenian people that discovers, develops, and champions cutting edge talent in film and music and across all creative fields. For example, we offer the annual Creative Armenia AGBU Fellowships, and you'll meet our AGBU, Creative Armenia AGBU Fellow, Emily, today. We run a residency for Armenian artists with the Borosian Foundation in Brussels. Uh, we have a large network uh, of artists, and we administer spark grants to people like Lika Zakarian and Savannah, whom you'll meet uh, on the panel today as well. Just yesterday, actually, we, aw we awarded a, a new wave of spark grants to 18 uh, cutting edge creators, many of whom are doing incredible work in Artsakh or about Artsakh. Um, most relevant to our panel since the autumn uh, of 2020, uh, our Artists for Artsakh program has been championing, funding, and giving exposure to creators who are using their imagination and using their creativity to bring attention and recognition to Artsakh and people. So I'm especially grateful for the opportunity we have today to meet some of the leading filmmakers, writers, uh, musicians, and other creators who've been on Artsakh's front line. Uh, some of them literally and others by virtue of their commitment to telling the stories uh, of that sacred place. Uh, you'll learn about them in a moment, but first, your moderator, Carla Garabedian, uh, came on my radar with her film Screamers, which features the band System of a Down and which masterfully weaves through uh, a powerful narrative through a century uh, of genocides. It was a very effective film that won many awards and created real impact in the cause of genocide recognition. And I was inspired uh, to meet the artist behind the film. And I was so surprised to learn that the artist behind the film was just as effective as her creation, which is not typical. Uh, little did I know that Carla had been a BBC World News anchor, um, but she wasn't merely a TV personality. She had honed in on her instincts as a filmmaker and her commitment to human rights through a sequence of films on North Korea and Iran and Afghanistan and other places. I learned also that she held a PhD in international relations, which meant that I also admired how she could navigate the academic world and play very strategic roles in the Shoah Foundation at USC and the Promise Institute at UCLA. And beyond that, I learned of her work uh, in film preservation through the Armenian Film Foundation and the Pomegranate Foundation. And so when we founded Creative Armenia some years ago, I was delighted to ask her and I was, I was so honored that she accepted our invitation to become a founding member of Creative Armenia and she continues to be a frequent mentor to our artists. So I'm so grateful that Carla can be our moderator today. I'm excited to learn that Carla is now in production on her film, Nemesis 1921, a crime drama about the Tellurian trial in Berlin. So grateful to you, Carla, and to our brave and talented artists here on the panel and to our creative community for coming together to have this important conversation. Over to you, Carla. Thank you all so much uh, for being here. Thank you, Garin, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of this panel today. Um, really five, uh, I would say, very brave creative artists um, talking about their art in a time of war and peace. And Creative Armenia is about providing a platform to unite and support Armenian artists. And as you will see today, they are different kinds of artists. While the theme today is Artsakh, four out of five of our panelists don't actually live there, but they are motivated by what's going on there. And for them, maybe for years, maybe for a moment in time, whatever, that place has become their inspiration. I was struck by something that Serge Tankian said yesterday in the opening panel, that the way we judge an artist today essentially comes down to whether that person is being honest, or authentic to themselves. We do art because it is something we must do. It is a personal expression of our human condition. In this case though, it becomes more than that because when a conflict is going on, a conflict that affects our identity, 
the effects of our art on the in the outside world it becomes a variable people watch they listen they feel our art and whether it be written or played or filmed we may not be seeking attention but the fact that we are doing our art in the midst of a conflict that is attracting world attention that does affect what we do whether we like it or not so what I would like to do today with our panelists is to find out from each of them their story, what motivated them to do their film, their writing, their music, whatever it is, with this conflict raging in the midst. Let's find out the facts of what brought them to the subject matter, to Artsakh, what inspired them before, during, or after, whatever it is. And then perhaps let's look at the effects, intended or not to what extent the public dialogue or perception of Artsakh has been affected by artists. You know, we don't work in a vacuum. We have families, organizations, patrons who believe in us and support us. How has that network affected these artists? How has each of these artists been supported? You know, we get that question a lot at Creative Armenia. Support. To what extent has that support or lack of it affected their work? So here we go. The subject is art in the times of war and peace. So let's start off with Emily Mokardichian, a filmmaker. Now, I actually knew about Emily. She doesn't know this because we didn't have a chance to talk about it. But back in 2013, she made a film um, with Anahid Yajan called Levon. And uh, over the years, I've also been very aware of Halo's work with landmines in Artsakh. And I was thrilled to discover that Emily had made a documentary about women working on ridding the land of landmines um, before the 2020 war. Let's just see right now, before we get Emily on, a clip from her film, Motherland, and then we'll come out the other side. So that was a clip from Motherland, and it was um, a documentary, Emily Wright, that you, you made before 2020. What was it that attracted you to the subject matter to make that documentary initially? Um, yeah, so we, we filmed that short documentary in 2017. Um, I, great question. I mean, I had been living in Armenia for about five years and had spent time in Artsakh um, not professionally, like not filming or following stories there. But um, when a friend of mine had sent me some articles, oh no, sent me a photo story actually by Scout to Think Jen, um, about the women who had just started, I think maybe the year before, maybe 2016, they'd started working at Halo. Um, they'd been, they'd begun hiring female deminers. Um, and we thought it was an interesting story. So we did a, a two week trip to where we embedded with a group of women. Um, it, I think it was the first all female group. Everyone in the group was um, a woman who was a deminer. And so we embedded with them for two weeks um, and made the short film. Um, yeah, I think originally the, the motivating idea behind the short was how these women were quite strong in doing a, a job that was um, unexpected or a little bit um, maybe outside of the norm. But then after spending time with them, it became really clear that it wasn't such a, a simple, um, a simple idea of what strength was. Like we ended up, I think, telling a story that was a little bit more um, nuanced and about the women and what led them to where they were and how they were using the work to take care of their families and what that strength really looked like in a more complicated way. So would you say after filming that, that you you felt like, okay, I've done that subject, now I'm moving on, that maybe you wouldn't do another film about Artsakh or how, what was the progression getting to your next project there was and there was not? 
Um, so actually making that film, spending time with those women really uh, made me very curious. So what kind of happened is we embedded with this group of women and we found that almost every woman in that group actually um, had been divorced and had been divorced because they were in an abusive relationship. Um, and so that brought up a lot of questions for me about like how that might have happened and what were the social forces that um, that were happening in this place that caused that. And so I started doing research around um, like w the role of women in post-conflict regions. And it turns out that there's a there's a like there's just a lot around the world in regions like this. Women tend to shoulder a lot of the responsibility of what it takes to rebuild a country and pull a community together. Um, and that was really interesting to me because I think a lot of time that work is invisibilized, if that's a word. Um, like we don't necessarily hold that up as a very typical form of strength. Um, and we don't really recognize women for the role they play in, in community building and, and state building. Um, so that kind of led me to think more about that. And so what I ended up doing was um, finding four characters in um, all who live in Stepanagar. Well, one lived in Shushi. Um, and who all work in different um, fields and kind of work for peace or justice or um, like peace and justice and fairness um, and the safety of their country in different ways. So one of the women works at Halo and is a designer. One is active in politics. One um, is a martial artist, does um, judo and represents art soft um, to the rest of the world. And um, one founded the only women's center in the country. Um, so I, the next film I, or that I'm making now um, kind of grew out of that curiosity of like, what really is the work that women do and how do they see themselves in that work and how do they continue to see a future um, despite maybe what uh, the people around them tell them or how do they keep working for a version of themselves that is not as typical or normal in their society. So you started this film before the conflict or did you start there was there was not after the conflict? No, I'd been shooting the film for three years before. the. Oh, conflict. my goodness. Right. Yeah. And just happened to be there on a shooting trip when when the war started. So how do you think the conflict will affect your work and the progress of 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 your film? Uh, it, it completely changed the narrative arc of the film. Um, it definitely was completely unexpected and I ended up, um, I was in Stepanagert for most of the war with the women. We kind of left and came back together a few times. Um, I filmed things I never, ever, ever thought or believed I would film. Um, I think before, before, um, it was... Uh, I, w I was working with an artist to create these portraits of the women as they wanted to be seen in their imaginations. Um, so it was kind of like more about how women can imagine themselves as different from those around them and what role does art have to play in that. Um, and now it's really about what it looks like to be a woman before, during, and after conflict. Um, and now what I'm thinking about a lot is... Uh, repetition, the repetition of history, generational repetition. Um, I've started to take scenes that I filmed three years ago and refilm them now after the war and kind of see how they echo each other and what's the same what's different. Um, so yeah, it, it's had a, a completely transformative effect, I would say. I mean, the characters are the same. The pieces of the filmmaking in my style are the same, but um, yeah, the narrative arc is quite different. I mean, it seems to me that having a voice for these women in the world, especially now, is so important. Otherwise, they would be invisible. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, um, as women, the work that we do, again, is like often not not very seen. And so initially, the intention was to find that work and hold it up to a magnifying glass and do it justice. And yeah, I think after after this conflict the work that they have to do is bigger uh it's more difficult um and the ways that they try to hold on to hope and continue to wake up every day and find something productive to do and hold their family together hold their community together um that those little pieces are the things that i would really like to show and explore 
Well, we'll be watching you. And um, on on the subject of very strong women, um, <laughs> I, I'd like to turn to Lika Zakarian, who um, many people who have uh, used CivilNet as a way to get information about uh, the 2020 war conflict have followed Lika's journey. And um, Lika has a various, you know, video dialogues. Uh, she had a diary of her experiences covering the conflict. She has a photo essay that we'd like to show you now. Why don't we just see a little bit of her photo essay as much as we can in this time and, and then talk to Lika on the other end of it. Here is Lika Zakarian's uh, photo essay. So, I mean, that's just a, a small selection of Lika's work. And of course, Lika's in Stepanakert as we speak, and she has been in Stepanakert, I believe for the whole of the time that we're talking about. Um, and she, um, Lika, as I, as I was reading about you, your brother and a friend was on the front line. Your mother was working as a nurse in a hospital. First and foremost, how are they? Can you bring us up to date on their status and how you are? And thank you, Carla, uh, for introducing me and for your kind words. Um, so, um, yes, when the war started, um, like I, I was born in Artsakh and all these people above mentioned, they all were born in Artsakh. And uh, so this is where actually we live. And we were in here when the war started. And um, now everyone who I wrote about in my diary, uh, they are alive and they are still in Stepanakert and continuing their work. That's really amazing. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it must have been just a, as you were saying in one of your um, excerpts I saw this morning, your diary excerpts on CivilNet, you said, you know, it's one thing uh, to just be a journalist and try to cover the facts, to just be an eyewitness and to try to bear witness, to tell people what's going on. It's another thing to communicate the emotions, just being a human in, in a conflict like this. And I thought that was a very important distinction to make because I think what has moved so many people in your work um, is that you have conveyed these emotions. Yeah, actually, um, I when the war started, I had only two months journalism experience. I started to work at the end of July, like in August, we had only August and September, nearly two full months that we had before the war started. So I didn't really have a huge experience in this area. And um, I am political scientist by profession, not a journalist. So uh, I had only 10 uh, months courses uh, of journal civic journalism and uh, work corresponding wasn't uh, going into this. Um, but I didn't have time to learn it step by step. It, it was just um, the war and you are supposed to do whatever you can. So I, I like to say that war um, was my teacher as a journalist. And um, of course, civil net stuff, they helped me a lot with this. Because sometimes we didn't even have time to, uh, for example, to set. Uh, so they check and like the editors, we, we were just doing it very... Uh, spontaneously and sending and everything was going um, well. So uh, that's why it, it was very difficult as it was my first war that I really, really see. Uh, I mean, I have been in Artsakh also, like I was here when uh, April war started as well, but then nothing happened in Stepanakert. We, we organized some volunteers group with it, this and that, but that was... Um, for me personally, experience uh, when we talk about experience, that was nothing compared to this one. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time, and uh, all my um, close people were having their service, and then we were supposed to write about people's pain, like people whom you know. It's I think much more difficult when you write about your lovely one's pain. 
Mm, yeah, so I totally agree with you. <laughs> that is very controversial. <laughs> Well, there were many of us in the diaspora who were, were reading daily accounts and, you know, whether it be on social media or civil net and these daily accounts were very important in sort of creating a context. And otherwise you're, you know, you feel very isolated and you're wanting to know what's going on, but we were heavily relying on people like you to communicate this stuff. I mean, did you find the contact with other journalists in the international community was helpful to you or was it a distraction? Um, honestly, no. Uh, I, we had some journalists, international journalists that were here at that time, and I made very good contacts and I uh, could, could meet people. And that was the positive side, maybe, uh, of the war. Um, I met very good professionals. But when it comes to the diary, um, it wasn't planned to be a diary, actually. It was just um, a post, first time when I wrote. It was just a post on Facebook. And then I just called it the 11th day when I first published. Uh, I was writing also before, but sometimes never, not publishing or publishing, but part by part, not calling it 11th day, 10th day. And then I called it the 12th day and then it just came like this. And when people started to like it, I felt it important um, that uh, because um, it wasn't for CBNet actually, it was like just for it was just very emotional. Then um, uh, our editors uh, in Sydney they liked it and they said, "Oh, let's uh, post it also as a column in our website and translate it into English because I was writing in Russian." So it was their idea to put it to the website uh, to spread it, kind of because. Um, before that, it was only on my Facebook page, in my Telegram channel, and it was in Russia. So it was uh, basically for Russian speaking um, people, but they made it uh, wider um, and also got in. So it, I guess, uh, on civil net. So uh, they helped me with this. I didn't even imagine that it could be uh, loved or it, people could read it because it was really emotional and it was for nobody it was really for for me because um, that time i was feeling very lonely and um, it was a way for expression uh, when you can't uh, tell anybody uh, because everybody is in the same situation you cannot surprise anyone with your pain then yeah it was just a way for for feeling better but then it, it became um Inter something interesting and I was even if I had uh, nothing to say I couldn't uh, stop it because people were waiting and they were texting and people wanted to know um, and they kind of got acknowledged to people they don't know and um, other people who are not even Armenians they starting to care not about Karabakh in general but um, about some people whom it seems they know already about. So it, it was something really personal. And I think uh, through diary, uh, I made very good friendships, long, lifelong friendships. So do you think you might possibly make it into a book or something else? Um, yes, I think. <laughs> Well, you know, we often get questions in Creative Armenia, people, different artists from different, you know, uh, disciplines wanting, asking about timing, you know, I need help to do this, I need help to do that. And your experience really, it, it makes it makes the, the very um, common experience of artists that you cannot always determine the path of your career, but you can have things happen to you. And if you're ready to take that opportunity and go with it, and be your authentic self, take your skills and be yourself, you can actually succeed. I mean, it's, it sounds odd, but there is often a silver lining in disaster. Faced with what is no less than an existential crisis, uh, life and death with the people around you, the circumstances you're in, you were able to uh, rise. There's no other word for that. There's, you took that situation and you were able to rise from it. And not everybody can do that, but often, art is born in those sort of circumstances. So um, I applaud you for hanging in there. And um, we we all, I think all of us can say, we look forward to seeing that book because it would be nice to kind of savor some of those, um, some of those passages that you wrote and be able to, you know, with the 
with passage of time, be able to look back and see um, what you were going through. So, so hang on there because we may have, I think we have some questions that will come through at the end. So hopefully we'll get back to, um, to you. But for the moment, um, I'd like to move on to our next panelist, Savana Chakarian, who has a very interesting journey. Um, went to Yerevan in 2015 and um, you can read about her um, on Creative Armenia, but just in a in a in a nutshell, a Paris-born Armenian went to Yerevan in 2015, opened a music and arts center in Yerevan called the Nexus Center, and worked with um, children in preschool and elementary school. So this is all before 2020. This is what she was doing. Um, but then the situation in 2020 hits, and um, what what is Savannah going to, going to do next? And what she did was very interesting. Savannah, thank you for joining us today. Um, there you were with the situation, refugee children coming in for arts from Artsakh. Um, what motivated you to do what you did next? Thank you. Hi, Carla. Hi, everyone. I'm very honored to be here. Um, so when the war broke, actually, I was supposed to go on tour three days later. I was supposed to go to Europe and uh, after one day of not happening what's going on, is it going, is it going to be like, to, we don't know what's happening. And then when we realize, no, it's a, it's a full scare war and that's gonna, not going to stop in four days. So uh, I said, I can't go. <laughs> I can't go to, uh, to tour. So I had to cancel my plans, not knowing what I was going to do. But I knew that whatever I was going to do in Armenia was going to be more uh, important at, than anything else. And after a few days, we heard that the families, a lot of families were coming to Yerevan uh, from Artsakh. And so one day I just, without really planning, I went on Facebook Live and I said, okay, so there are all these families. I see that there are already Facebook groups organizing food and sheltering and helping these families like with um, material, you know, like with basic aid. And as musicians and, and as artists, maybe we, we could help them by uh, do, giving them music workshops. So my, I had like a very direct uh, call to actions kind of. I said, if you are a family sheltering uh, people from Artsakh, if you are hotel sheltering families from Artsakh, we can come to you. And I said, if you are musicians helping uh, who are interested or artists, let's join and let's do something together. And very quickly, the same day, I had like three or four different uh, organizations based in Yerevan who told me, okay, we have like 50 uh, people in this hotel. We have 100, and pe 100 people in this shelter. So we started, uh, I don't know, starting from day four or five, going to, to see uh, the displaced families and um, performing for them and having educational programs, you know, like doing music workshops, rhythmic workshops. And after a week, I got a call from the um, Mars Petaran from the region of Tavush saying, okay, we saw what you're doing because I was also going live uh, to update um, my friends and my family on what was happening. And so the videos uh, were seen by the other regions and, and we were asked to also go outside of Yerevan because there were a lot of families also in, uh, in Lori, in Tavush, in Sunik. So we ended up for the, yeah, for two months uh, because we continued after the end, official end of the war, we continued going to see the families, to play with them, um, sponsored, sponsored the, mu the musician kids as well. We had, we were focusing on, on musician kids uh we were buying art supplies so that they can also have kind of um uh, a daily life going on because honestly in a, in a lot of hotels it was not only there was the trauma of what was happening but also the kids were very bored and right. uh and you you also see that the most of the adults were uh, were the mothers the the women who were they couldn't function because their husband, their son, their their brothers, they're on the front line. So they were already also, they, they, they it was kind of, we were also helping them to take care of the kids and they would join us, the, the, the adults as well. We worked with teenagers, so it was a totally different um, 
energy and different needs. And then we started going and to see the wounded soldiers who were in the hospitals uh, in the Yerevan and in the region as, as well. And that's kind of our day, that was our daily life. I'm trying to imagine um, in myself in that circumstance, I'm sure that you were experiencing a certain amount of trauma coming face to face with these families uh, in this, this dire situation. I mean, how did it affect you personally? Uh, I had like a burnout at the end of December, but until that I couldn't, we couldn't stop. And everyone was telling us, you, you need to take a, a days off or you need to, but the thing is, I don't know, we feel already so, I, there is i don't know i didn't have any i couldn't do it any other way uh but what was helping us is that the the parents were were telling us thank you you at least brought a little bit of positivity this day or we went to see um psychological facilities where all the soldiers were the the um, soldiers with, with with depression and with psychological uh, mental issues were staying and um head doctor said we had never seen them smiling. We went, I think, end of November, and they said this is the first time we saw, we saw the, the patient smiling. And so when, you, when we hear that, it's also for us, it's sharing the, like channeling this trauma and sharing these emotions, even if they're negative emotions, it's a healing process for everyone. So it's, a, it's an exercise of catharsis, you know? Yeah. There's a there's a very uh, extensive article about your work in the Mirror Spectator, um, which describes the process of what you're doing, and that you had a a phrase in there that uh, of being a creative warrior. Of, I think that was your phrase. It was in the article, but I, I I took to that phrase. I thought, oh, that's an interesting way of putting it. It's uh, it's what can I do in this situation as an artist? And what you were doing was you were you were not sitting back. You were being proactive, and you were taking your art to the people who were experiencing conflict. I mean, not everybody uh, would think of doing that. I um, mean, a lot of us sit in our own, you know, studios or whatever, and you know, work in an isolated way. You were doing exactly the opposite. Yeah, I mean, for me also, the reason why I'm doing music is to share, play with others, and to share it with others. So, uh, performing and playing live is something that I love. But you know why I said, cre like, the the term cre uh, creative warrior, I don't even remember, came because one of my main partner, uh, a, a musician named Gorta Devosian, yes. um, was actually, for the first week, he every day he was changing his mind. He was saying, I'm going to go to the front lines uh, as a volunteer. And then, and, and then kind of going to the first meeting, and then he, he, he would end up not going. And I told him, you know, like, Gor, you could go. I'm not going to... And you have to do what you have to do, but you think, wh how are you going to be the, honestly the most efficient? Because you had your military service eight years ago, you haven't touched a gun ever since, and you're a musician, so you just think about it. And, and so okay, finally we, we ended up doing all this adventure together. So that's a, that's a, a way also, I mean, all the panelists here are, are the proof of that. So how do you see your project progressing in the future? I mean, given the, the current situation, many of these families will remain displaced for certainly for a while. Um, where do you see your project going? So I'm still in touch with, um, with the musician kids that we sponsored, who we sponsored. Uh, and the last project that I did was actually in mid-March. Uh, in Van mm -hmm. integrating uh, families from, sorry, I, I'm hearing my voice two times. I don't know if it's the case for you as well. No, we're not hearing it. So you're okay. Okay. okay, okay. Integrating the families from Artsakh, the kids from Artsakh and the kids from Van Azor together. Uh, I will always be for sure involved in um, in, in music education, in education, but also all this experience gave me a more, like even more strength to per, to pursue music and to write new songs. I, I, I had a lot of also creative outbursts during this time. So I think that's also another way how um, 
all this experience, like how it shaped me also. You know, many people looking, other uh, ethnic groups uh, looking at us from the outside often have said, you know, how is it that Armenians, there's just an almost an overrepresentation of artists, whether it be musician, filmmakers, writers, um, we are a small people, but we are very artistic to put it sort of, you know, broadly. And, and I don't know what the answer is, to be honest, but I think that we certainly conflict has affected us. It has made us speak with a louder voice. That's my personal opinion. I mean, you've, I mean, all of you here, but I'm sure you've thought about this, how the conflict has affected um, your work. But Savannah, I mean, thinking about it, putting it into perspective, um, do you think that music gives these people more hope or is it some sort of catharsis for the defeat that they feel? Is it all those things together? Yeah, I think, you know, what I saw also in the communities we visited was that uh, everyone, like, even in the worst times, I saw, I still saw a resilience in the people. And for me, like, the musical work we did was channeling that trauma and, and celebrating the resilience. And also for me, it's very important, even more so after what we, we went through, is to, to defy kind of the campaign of cultural erasure. <laughs> eraser uh, that's characterizing the, this conflict, you know? So I think as artists, um, yeah, I don't, we, I demand that we, we, we be heard and that we are not silenced. Well, for the moment, um, I'm gonna use that as a, as a segue to um, our, our next panelist, Nora, Nora Matrosian. Um, it's interesting because we've we, we've touched on how the conflict has uh, its timing has affected our, our our work in different ways, our progress or not. Um, it, and Nora's in an interesting situation where she had a film she had already made and had already been accepted to a film major film festival. It just happened to be <laughs> about Artsakh. And uh, of course it was happening, that festival was happening in a pandemic. So that was a little out of the ordinary. So, um, so Nora, uh, be before we see a clip of your film, I just want to ask you, did it ever enter your mind that um, the conflict would, would sort of, uh, you know, rear its head and happen while you were sh premiering your film at the AFI Film Festival? Are you there, Nora? There she is. <laughs> Hi, can you hear us? Oh, you've you've actually blocked your um, speaker. There you go. There you go. Yeah, okay, no, excellent. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the inv invitation, and I'm very honored to be here with this beautiful young Armenian women. <laughs> And I have heard about the work of Emily, the work of Savannah. I was reading Lika's diary during all the days of the war. So I'm very happy to meet you <laughs> a bit. Um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, I went to Artsakh for the first time in 2009. And I knew about Artsakh from uh, my friends because I'm from Yerevan and as everybody in Armenia, I have some Karabakh uh, roots. But I went there just to see what does it look like, I, just from like stupid curiosity, let's say, because it was yeah, like 20 years of uh, ceasefire. And I was amazed to see this country that exists physically had, that had no political and juridical existence on the world maps. And I wanted to make a film uh, about this paradox and to give a uh, body to Arta. And it took me 11 years to find the financing and also to find what is the story that can tell tell Artsakh, not the small story, but this big story about the country. And when I was trying to finance it, it was really funny because you are trying to get money and, and uh, the juries, they ask you, so who is the main character? And I was saying the main character is Artsakh. It's a feature film, but the main character is Artsakh. And during all these years, we were very conscious 
of the fact that this ceasefire can be broken any moment. Mm -hmm. And this fragility of this uh, ceasefire, it is something that uh, is very present, was very present in Arta. And uh, our luck was that we managed to make the film, we managed to bring it to Cannes Film Festival, and it's a huge honor for us, and it's so amazing for the film and for Arta. And um, it was uh, just next day after our French premiere that uh, then the war started. So some way we knew that it could happen, but uh, uh, as uh, the film is also about hope, uh, we hoped that it wouldn't happen. Let's see, let's use this moment to, to show a clip from Nora's film, which is Should the Wind Drop? Let's see a clip now. Voyons l'un de vos siens, des vecteurs de l'aéroport. Alors, comment vous trouvez notre petite cathédrale aéroportière North, northeast, Azerbaijan, enemy. Northwest, Armenia, Georgia, friendly. Close your window. Close, close. Hey. What's this? Your setup doesn't allow for circling due to the proximity of the border? No. Alors, il faut que vous compreniez ce que représente cet aéroport pour notre pays. Dès que cet aéroport fonctionnera, la communauté internationale sera obligée de nous reconnaître. Can you take me to the border? Leo Karabakh n'est pas sur vos cartes, mais le pays existe. Light bill. Arty, Arty. Uh, uh, for the film's release, Nora. Uh, your, your question, Carla, sorry. Uh, what, are, what is the next step for the film and its release? When will, when will we be able to see it around the world? Yeah, in fact, um, after Cannes Festival, the film had an amazing career all over the world. It went to Japan, it went to Korea, it will be in Iran, it, uh, in United States, the, it was, represented as young French cinema because it's also French production, I live in France. And um, uh, because of the pandemic, I followed the life of the film from my couch. <laughs> and uh, in exactly one week, we have our French release in plenty of cinemas in France. So it's a very big moment because, it's very strange because I really, uh, struggled to make this film because I thought it's so important to tell it and uh, to tell the story, to tell it this way. And uh, today all the journalists and uh, the cinema critics, they come to me also for the explanations of the things that maybe they wouldn't understand in the film if the conflict wouldn't happen. So it's also a bit tragical, I think. I would have preferred it to be a different way for it to stay as a kind of a fantastic story of an airport that doesn't have planes and that hopes for opening and the recognition. But uh, the reality is uh, much harder than the fiction is. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can imagine. I mean, it, I think a lot of people don't know that independent films often take that long to, to get together and but it still stands in its own in its own uh, way for um, a moment and several moments in time that we we the hope that we had for Artsakh the fears we had for Artsakh 
Um, so even though the conflicts happened, although there's one question um, that came from a creative Armenian staff was if you, uh, I hate being asked questions like this, but if you had it to, to do again, or if you were still in production, would you do anything differently? I hate those questions, <laughs> but I was asked to ask it. So um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, you're not the first one. You are not the first one to ask the question. Often, when I uh, show the film in the cinema halls, people they do ask this question, and uh, it took me some time to realize what do I really think? Uh, how do I should how should I answer? In fact, I tried to make a film in a very honest way, not taking parts, talking about what I saw in front of my eyes, and the main line of the film is the hope. And I think even after the war, I hope Lika is the most right person to be asked about it, but I hope that this hope is still relevant. So I think I wouldn't change anything uh, in the film. It, uh, it is an archive of uh, time that I went to Artsakh and I liked this Artsakh and I saw it and the world can see it because it is on the film and whatever happens politically, whatever how whatever strong is the denial, the film is the proof of uh, what I witnessed during the 10 years of uh, like the last 10 years of the ceasefire. We have a question from um, one of our, our listeners about um, the balance between telling a story and conveying the truth of actual events in a film. Um, here's the question. Do you think in films that are based on truth, truth should serve the story or the story should serve the truth? Um, you know, with this Arsakh war, we are all, uh, we all clearly understood that there is no truth. This is the first thing, there is no truth. <laughs> or at least <laughs> we are too far from the truth to know it. But uh, I think the cinema is not there to tell the truth. I think the cinema is to rise the reality into, uh, uh, in my case, that's what I was trying to do, to a fiction that would affect emotionally and intellectually. So in fact, this is this uh, emotional and intellectual effect for me is more important than the truth. But it is, I think, important that the film is based on the reality, not the truth, but the reality. And here's another question for um, our filmmakers, but I think it also applies to, um, it's actually everybody on our panel. Is there, are there any ethical considerations that should, that filmmakers should keep when creating films about tragic events like the War of Artsakh? Um, well, that applies to reporters as well and to journalism. So ethical considerations. I and mean, I think in a, in a certain sense, Nora just answered that question from her point of view is telling the truth is what your your ethical obligation is. But um, I'll just throw it open to any of you. What is the role of ethics in, um, in telling your stories? Uh, I can try to form an answer. I think, um, I mean, documentary is, of course, a bit different than fiction. Um, and I think that for me, the ethical, like for me, the, my ethical responsibility is to the people in my film, the people who are sharing their story. So I see that ethical obligation as the creation of a relationship that's based on trust. Um, and that they can trust me that I would, you know, ultimately I have control over a narrative that will be shown to lots of people that they don't have control over. But it, you know, I think when I think of truth, I think truth is something that is radically personal. Like if it does exist, it's subjective, but it's, it's, you only find it in a radically personal experience. And so the intimate experience that these women have of going through this time and allowing me into that experience, I have an ethical responsibility to them um, to, to do right, I guess, or to, you know, it's not necessarily about um, telling the story in the way that someone else thinks that you should do it, but that you are responsible in your relationship to another human whose story you're telling. 
Um, Nora, because your film is uh, so, so recently um, been out there in the world, have there been any surprises in the way that people have reacted to the subject matter? I mean, I would imagine that most people didn't, what, they weren't even aware of uh, where Artsakh was or the issues in its history, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, uh, uh, before the, the war, the last war, uh, uh, most of the French critics and also like if you're in the United States, there were some that uh, uh, thought that it's a fantastic film about a fantastic place, which is called uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. <laughs> um, uh, in France, uh, the information about the war during this 44 years was uh, broadly uh, um, told, shown, so it really changed the, the discussions that I had with the public. Uh, and what uh, during the war, in fact, during the war, I was showing my film, when the war started, I was showing my film and presenting it every evening. So during the day, I was following the news and every evening I had to speak about the film to the public. And what I thought, what was important, what people said that, in fact, you know, you read what is happening in Togo and you say that many people dead and that many buildings uh, destroyed. But I think the film gave uh, faces and bodies uh, and the architecture to this um, abstract uh, newspaper uh, words. Mm -hmm. and I think that was important. That was uh, was reported a lot, and uh, um, I think, for example, there was a, a TV reportage on the film, and uh, the name of this reportage was uh, "Recognition of Artsakh by Cinema, but not by Politics." So. Yeah, I think it does. It's small, very small road. And just, uh, I would like to go back to what Emily said about the truth and about the ethics. Uh, I think it is very important, especially in our matters. And as I like hear what the other panelists say, uh, I think it's very important to serve the idea, not to use it to go in front, but to be a, in some sense servant. So I, all the way, I felt myself as a servant of what I had to carry. And I think this is the ethical position that is important when you try to talk to people. And I think what uh, Lika was doing, it was also this. In fact, it was not for her. She was serving this case, and there were so many thousands, maybe even millions of people who were following what she had to say. Uh, well, a listener is asking, do you really think that art and film can bring political and social change, or art being a more refined medium having its own boundaries? Well, that's this big question, isn't it? Can art and film bring political and social change, or is it a more refined medium that has its boundaries? Who would like to take that one on? <laughs> I can Savannah, who, who's, who's speak, is that Savannah there? I can uh, start. If, if go ahead. Emily. I think Lika wants to speak, There's but I, I would also. Emily, Lika, either one of you, go ahead, go for it. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, after this war, like before the war, I, I was believing that, um, I don't know, people can change anything or um, you, if you are doing something good, you can change anything, like anything big, not like in someone's life. But after this war, I just um, I think that... Um, nothing can change politics, only international, um, like people who rule this all, like uh, they are ruling and it's their uh, decisions. Some, uh, I call them men in suits. So they just sit and decide something and everything else happens. And nothing happens just because, um, I don't know, some guy um, killed somebody in the border and then a big war is coming. Nothing happens like this and nothing ends uh, because uh, somebody 
like Azeri didn't take sushi because armies were running or we had bad um, uh, army. This all maybe have also something uh, to do with this, but I think it's not up to us to decide anything in politics when it comes to bigger issues or uh, like who will um, be, uh, who will owe sushi. It, it's not um, uh, up to us to decide or whatever we do, if it was supposed to happen, it will happen and men and Swiss, they will decide. And uh, that's very um, bad and I'm uh, saying it with a big pain because um, uh, sometimes I also was uh, thinking, uh, especially after war, why am I continuing doing this? Why do I do it? Like uh, people call the media for fourth power and like um, uh, that, that media is uh, doing this and that. But um, no, nothing matters because during the war, many international media uh, representatives were in Artsakh, like Vice News and uh, like BBC or m many others, and they uh, recorded uh, how they are shelling to the civilians. But nothing happens, or international organizations or other countries, they are making statements and, oh, please, we call on like both sides to stop. But, this is all useless and I'm, I'm repeating myself, I'm saying it with a big pain that um, people like us, we are doing our best. Yes, I, I think that we can change someone's mind, uh, someone's uh, way of thinking, uh, someone's attitude to something or um, in this topic to Karabakh, but um, these people uh, are not always deciding or are not the ones, who, uh, the, the decision makers. I know that it uh, um, sounds a bit um, negative, and, uh, but I, I apologize, I didn't want to sound negative. I just, uh, I'm just so disappointed right now uh, that, that I don't see um, that, um, I believe that what we do is very important. It is extremely important. And when I'm asking myself, why do I continue uh, going to the border villages right now and talking to people, making reports about them, uh, taking pictures of them, writing down their stories, I remind myself that I'm making a history, I'm writing a part of history and this will stay. And uh, this all archive will stay. And uh, this is what in some years will people will use and know what really happened and not let this um, uh, this information uh, go to centuries but to have something from this side something little something small but something very honest from this side and that's why i still believe that we are uh, what we um, uh, what these uh, beautiful women are doing it's, it's extremely important but when we talk about big politics Unfortunately, we are very um, small people to change anything big. Well, we have about five minutes left. I'm, I'm uh, Emily. Do you have? There was something that you wanted to say as well. Uh, no, I think Savannah had something to say, right. and then also okay. give a little signal. Go ahead, Savannah. I am not not going to contradict Lika. Uh, I also don't think that uh, that we can make uh, big political changes, but I don't think I think we shouldn't have boundaries in the way we express ourselves. If if anyone can can keep it real and really tell the story, what's really happening? It's, it's uh, the artists, the journalists, and I do believe that yes, as Lika said, you can create change in the human behavior in the civil society through art and through music because. Uh, music is, I'm talking about music, but it's in art in general, it creates empathy and it, it allows people to connect and, and yeah, as Emily said, you see the faces of the people who live there. As Nora said, you tell the, the stories of the people in art, in, in Artsakh and, and Lika through her, her, her daily stories as well. You, you really take out all the oh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and you, do, you feel the pain and you feel the emotions like the, the viewer and the, or the reader can actually kind of be a less more sensitive and more vulnerable and more empathetic uh, and have more empathy. And I think it's it's the first step. Maybe I'm being too uh, optimistic, but to a more like peaceful, at least like 
world. <laughs> These are big words, you know, but I was talking only on the human aspect and the individual behaviors. I think we now are in a period where uh, the, the voices of artists become even more important because the big the bigger news organizations are taking their attention off this part of the world as if it's sorted for them. And when they leave and the news cameras leave and the social media isn't so hot and heavy on this issue and it's left to the diaspora and the and the the, the greater Armenian community and Armenians uh, in Armenia, this is it's our duty and our obligation to not take our eyes off of it. And these stories, there's so many stories yet to be told to bear witness to. It's not like it's ended. In many ways, it's just begun. So for me, I, I, I hear Lika and I, and I hear the, the frustration at the political level. At the artistic level, though, um, there's still a lot of work to be done. And so, uh, so I can't say I look forward to that because it's going to be painful. And uh, there's a certain amount of suffering and bearing witness to that trauma, but we have we have that to look to look to in the future. So, I mean, on that note, if um, I'd like you all to sort of uh, offer a, a closing thought about your work moving into the future with this experience, not necessarily behind you, but with you. Um, I mean, how do you see um, your projects in the in the in the near to medium term future? Emily, why don't you start us off? Oh, okay, that is a tough one. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, I am continuing to film for the next several months and then we'll have to sit and um, edit this film. And the thing that I keep thinking or holding on to is that in editing this film and taking everything that's happened and creating a story out of it, putting it into some sort of narrative that somehow I will be able to find and communicate some sort of meaning. Um, and whether that's through the radical experiences of the people in the film, um, of the country itself, um, I'm hoping that in structuring it to convey some sort of meaning that other people will be able to feel something from it. Um, and as Lika said, it can be a record of something that shouldn't be forgotten and is quite important. Right, Savannah, do you want to be next? From now on, I just want to work towards like lifting Armenian excellence. I think this is the, the most excellent people of, uh, I mean, excellent, or the, um, just lifting up Armenian voices through music or through like lifting other talented people. I think that's, that's what I, I can at least do. Just right. to, to tell our story to the world. Nora. Are you there, Nora? Let's go to um, uh, Lika, are you there? Yes. Um, could you please repeat the question? I, I'm not sure if I understood right. Um, just how you see your work in the future moving forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, uh, before the war, I like war helped me to find some new things that I like, and I think that I will continue with this. And now I am uh, thinking about continuing with writing. And I have some ideas of um, of books, of a book. One idea of a book uh, that doesn't about it's not about diary, but about something else. But um, I think I will continue writing um, and documenting uh, real stories and into something bigger and wider. Well, we look forward to that. And finally, Nora. Um, I, I was planning to, uh, I was writing a new film uh, before the war and when it happened to all of us, you understand how irrelevant all other stories are. So as we are profoundly affected by what happened, I think it also will come into my work in my future film. And I just wanted to say uh, that I think that uh, any creation is an act of resistance. 
and uh, I agree with everything which was said. We cannot do much about the politics, but if we stop resisting, we are dead. So I would encourage everybody <laughs> to go on creating because creation is an act of resistance. Well, on that note, um, I want to uh, thank all of you for participating in this panel today. Um, if you notice, we did not get Sevak um, Avanesian to uh, come online, but um, I'd like I would really like to end um, our panel discussion with um, Sevak performing uh, in Gazanjitzat's Cathedral in Shushi. Um, I think it's a good note to end, although it's sad. Um, but we applaud his um, creative, the creative warrior in him um, for doing that. And for all of you who are listening, um, uh, thank you for listening. And um, I look forward to the next time we can be together. But let's go out on this note. Sevak Avanesian playing in Shushi. <laughs> was Sevak Avanisyan, who was performing in the Gazanjazat's Cathedral after it was bombed uh, in Shushi. And he found himself there and, um, and you know, with, with some, I would say, bravery, uh, inserted himself and played Gurunk there. So thank you to Sevak, and I hope that we can speak to him in the future. Thank you to all of our guests, Emily Mukherjee-chan, Lika Sagarian, Savannah Chakarian, Nora Martirosian. Thank you, thank you, and um, thank you again. We'll be back tomorrow with the next session of Creative Armenia Week. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>